Okay, well, let me just make a couple comments. Do you not know? Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Well, there are some eagles, you know, uh, in Psalm 91. Uh, you know, blessed is uh, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, uh, my God in whom will I trust. And it says, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, arise from perilous pest and he, his pestilence, and he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge, you know. So, um, but I heard a story one time about eagles and how that relates to the gospel, and I, I just thought it was kind of cute and worth remembering it, but it's a story about a Texas rancher, okay, uh, who one day was out in his ranch and uh, he was one, kind of at the edge of the mountains, and he looked up, and man, there was an eagle flying around up there. And it, he could see that eagle go and kind of land somewhere on the upper edge of the mountains there. And uh, he thought, well, it must, must be an eagle's nest or something up there, you know. So anyway, he, uh, you know, had some good boots, and he just started hiking up the mountain and to go find that eagle's nest. And so... Sure enough, he got up there, and there, there's an eagle's nest, you know, and so, and there was a few eagle's eggs in there. So he, he took one of them, kind of slid it in his pocket, went back down to the ranch, and he walked over to his chicken house, you know what I mean? So, and, and then kind of slid that eagle egg under one of his chickens, you know. And uh, so time went on, and uh, pretty soon all the little chicks were hatching, and uh, sure enough, the eagle egg hatched, you know, out comes a little baby eagle, and, and of course he's running around with the chickens, eating chicken food, and on and on and on, and, and uh, slowly growing up, you know, and one day that, uh, chick, or that eagle is kind of outside with the rest of the chickens, and he looks up in the sky, and he sees an eagle flying around, okay? And you think, oh man, I just, man, I, w I wish I could do that, mm, you know? And, well, what do you think? He can't do it. You know why? He thinks he's a chicken. Okay? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay? The only, only way that God, according to your faith, be it unto you, all things are possible to those that believe. And But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by that rhema of God. Okay? It is God. It's literally, God is alive. You know, he said, my ways and my thoughts are not your ways and your thoughts. And just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts above yours. And just as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and waters the earth and causes it to bring forth and bud and give, here's, here it is, seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will never return void without accomplishing that for which I sent it, you know. And you will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains of the hit and the hills will break into song before you. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. The, all of the curses that come from a life of disobedience and the sin nature are going to disappear. They're going to be replaced by the blessings that man was given back at the beginning. Okay, because as, as whatever we believe, all the things that pertain to life and godliness have already been given through the knowledge of him. The promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, you know. But, you know, faith is everything, you know. If I think I'm a chicken, <laughs> that's a bad thing. You, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, and that's, again, that, it, it, until we get that revelation, this is everything. This is the banna. We're going, the wilderness is a type of just the life on this earth. You know, it always seems difficult. There's trials and tribulations and all that kind of stuff.
but it's, it causes us to run to the Lord. Not run from him, run to him. You know what I'm saying? So um, anyway, um, so I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. You know, Job figured this out and he said, decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. All God's words are true, but you know what? It's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, the only way I can live a life of victory is not just believe it, but to say it, declare it, command it, decree it. You know, tell somebody else. In Philemon, there's a scripture that says, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of all that we have in Christ Jesus. Another translation says, I pray that you will activate your faith, which will happen as you share what God has already given you, okay? But the, all he gives you at first, it's just a seed. It's just a seed. But it, we don't get the huge harvest until we go plant it. We got to share it. Pat, you know, pass it on to others. And the more we do that, the stronger and stronger and stronger, you know, it, 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 does in, it happens in us. Does that, does that make sense? You know, you know so uh, th there is scripture. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search them out. The scripture is so full, just absolutely chock full of all kinds of hidden things, okay? Uh, the, the Jewish rabbis and teachers of the law for centuries, they've said that there are actually four levels, you know, uh, of things in the scripture. One is just kind of stuff floating on the surface. We think, well, that's just a historical, you know, statement of things that happened in the past or whatever, you know. But if that's all we're looking at, then we're missing the, the abundance of things hidden underneath that we can't see, you know. Paul, it was a good example. He knew the word inside out and backwards. He was a teacher. He, Abimelech, you know, he was trained by one of the greatest uh, rabbis of the time, you know, and he had a great respect, you know, but he was blind as a bat, just as blind as a bat. He was, <laughs> you know, because by the natural man understands not the things of God. He cannot know them. But you know, when he, on the road to Damascus, and Jesus appeared to him, all of a sudden, he became physically blind. Well, he's always been physically blind, you know, but he'd seen light, man. And so it's interesting that, remember the three days of darkness in, back in the Egyptian times, uh, you know, that was one of the plagues. So he, he was blind for three days. And then Ananias lays his hands on him, and uh, he was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden he could see. Something like scales fell off of his eyes, you know, and that, that's for each of us. I mean, everything, everything, okay? Uh, and, but he went out, the Bible says, immediately and began to teach that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, now did he get that by studying hard? Of course not, no. No, the same way Peter would said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Did he get that secondhand because Pastor so-and-so said something or this denomination said something? You know, or he went to a seminary and they said this or that? No, if it's from man, my friend, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, it doesn't mean anything. We watch out that no one deceives you. Many shall come in my name saying, oh, I'm Christ, I'm anointed, but shall deceive many, okay? And right now in these end times, I'm telling you what, there's a whole bunch of tares that are kind of mixed in with the wheat, okay? There used to be one Judas, but I'm telling you what, there's now hundreds of thousands or millions of them, okay? One of the principles of uh, understanding scripture is that Everything, God always starts with one, okay? Started with one, Adam, to fill the whole earth, okay? One, Jesus Christ, okay? But, but then, 
the, the law, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You know, so just like Mary received the rhema word that in Greek was called a sperma, <laughs> you know, that she said, well, may it be unto me according to thy word. He, and then Angel Gabriel says, well, now the, the father is going to overshadow you. And therefore, that which is conceived in you shall be called the son of God. And see, that's the same, exact same way we get born again. We just receive that word, which is Christ. That's him. That's him. And, and it, if we get it from God to the testimony of God, not a bunch of secondhand stuff, you know what I'm saying? The real deal, okay? Uh, Paul said one time, if anybody preaches to you a gospel other than the one I preached to you, let him be accursed. Well, let me tell you something. The vast majority of people out there, seminaries, churches, denominations, they got all kinds of problem areas, okay? Does that make sense? You know, and, and the only way we can find out we gotta gotta go to the Father. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Now, so we're gonna kind of get a little deeper into this uh, in the Book of Ruth. Okay, the Book of Ruth has four chapters, and uh, so we've got a four-page handout, um, and we we did uh, ch chapter one last week. We're gonna do chapter two. Okay. But so uh, we're gonna. Luke, let's see, do I have everything on, or can I start the timer, or what do I do? Uh, whatever you're ready, Jeff. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're going to continue with Luke, or I'm sorry, with uh, uh, Ruth. Ruth. Ruth, yeah. I just talked to Luke. So. <laughs> uh, no, what, what am I supposed to click? The timer? No, I haven't yet. Okay. Yeah. This is Steve Van Cura. Uh, this is Bread of Life Bible Study, and uh, it's going to be sent out on KPLE television, but other platforms, uh, Facebook, etc. If you could uh, look on the internet, Bread of Life Bible Study dot org, and uh, there's a lot of videos, handouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the handout for this the study of Ruth is there. Uh, we're going to start with a prayer. Okay. And uh, so let's bow our hearts and our heads. Father God, I just thank you, Father, that every single time, just all the time, you said, pray without ceasing in all things. Give thanks for this is the will of God the Father in Christ Jesus concerning you. And we're supposed to meditate in the word day and night. And Sounds like we're doing a double duty. Have to pray all the time, have to meditate on the Word all the time. And that's because as we meditate on the Word, your Spirit, the Spirit of God, anoints some Word and plants it in our hearts. You actually give us what and how to pray. The purpose of prayer is to first find the will of God and then come into agreement with it. All right? So just teach us how to do that, Lord. Open up this scripture right here, the book of Ruth, Lord, to bring it to life, Lord, and anointed by the Holy Spirit as a living seed planted in our hearts that by my own tongue, our own tongues, Father, that they become pens by which you write the living word on our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... Uh, so we did Ruth chapter 1. Now, uh, Ruth, if you remember right, uh, is a, a woman from, she's a Moabite, Moabite, okay? Uh, and in the, uh, this woman Naomi, okay, Naomi uh, means, her name means kind or pleasant or lovely. And she has a husband called Elimelech. Now, El is God, right? Melech means king, like Melchizedek, okay, is king of righteousness, all right? Now, knowing the meaning of names oftentimes is one way to find hidden things, you know, in the scripture. And the Holy Ghost will pop something up and begin to see it. Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. 
And of course, that's where Jesus was born. And he said, I am the bread of life. You know, it wasn't Moses that dropped down the manna in the wilderness, you know. He said, that's me. You know, and man does not live by bread alone, but in every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And of course, now I ask a question. Was Jesus a Jew? No, he was not. He was called the king of Jews, but he was a Judean. All right. Now what's interesting, the Jew, word Jews didn't appear until uh, in Babylon, that's when in 70 years of captivity there, they started to call them, you know, these the people, the Jews, you know, and they pretty soon kind of fell under that. But Jesus is a Judean. In other words, he is the tribe of Judah, okay, which means praise, okay. And in fact, you have to tabernacle in the wilderness. It's the J Judah tribe that's right next to the gate going in to the tabernacle, okay? And of course, he is the door into the sheepfold, but uh, he is the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So anyway, um, Naomi uh, has this man, Elimelech, uh, and they live in Bethlehem, but it says they lived during the days when the judges ruled. Now, if you read the book of Judges, you find out they just wax and wane all the time, and first obedience, then disobedience, and uh, all kinds of problems and complications and things of this sort because they didn't stay in that area of obedience. And so always, you know, some kinds of problems occurred. Now, there's 90 times in which the word famine is mentioned in the Bible. And Many times it was due because of disobedience. There's always consequences. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 28, there are many blessings for obedience and there's a bunch of, bunch of curses for disobedience. Now, sometimes we think, well, that's the Old Testament. You know, that doesn't apply to us today. My friend, that is wrong. You know, if we disobey God, there are consequences, okay? But thank God, you know, in 1 John, uh, John said, I write these things unto you, my children, that you do not sin, all right? But if we sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of the Holy Spirit or a gift of the Spirit is to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And so, you know, that's this thing called a conscience. Paul said he strives to keep a clean conscience before God, you know, and, and it is, boy, if all of a sudden something happens and he knows, uh-oh, you know, I'm stepping out of the light here and I'm stepping off the side of the narrow way to heaven, you know, got to better do something about it right away. Confess your sins, okay? And God is, he's faithful and just, okay? And every time we, that happens, a little bit of the flesh is sliced off. A little bit of flesh is sliced off. He not only forgives our sins, but he cleanses us from unrighteousness. That's the old man. And the process of obeying these things and by the Spirit of God, what's happening is, is, is the old man is being put to death. Being put to death. Okay, does that make sense? Anyway, but um, if you remember the Moabites and Ammonites, uh, just, just briefly, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about this book, Ruth. But the... Uh, what happened is Lot, remember, remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, well, Abraham had a, was he a, not, a bro, not a brother-in-law, was he a cousin? I, what was the, I called him a brother one time, but I don't think it was a brother. Uh, but anyway, um, he, uh, of course, came with Lot down into Israel, the Promised Land. And uh, Lot ended up being in uh, Sodom. Uh, and so, and there's a source of evil, evil, evil stuff going on there, okay? And one, one time, the, uh, when Adam, or I'm sorry, uh, God was talking to Abraham, he said, boy, I'll just, you know, since I'm in covenant with Abraham, I'm going to share with him what's on my mind and what I got to do and that kind of stuff because, you know, we're working together, okay? And so he tells about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I'm going to go down and just kind of check out what's going on. And if necessary, you know, I'm just going to wipe them out. So, uh, and uh, you've got a brother Lot down there and his family. And so uh, Abram starts to negotiate with God. Well, if you can find 50 righteous, could you spare them? You know, well, how about 
40. Uh, how about 30? Uh, how about, you know, on and on and on. Got down to 10, but when the angels got over there, you know, there weren't 10 righteous in there, okay? So, but he, you can read the whole story, but anyway, he takes, tells Lot, man, you got to get out of here, you know? And the two daughters, the two boys stayed there, okay? The two daughters came, the wife left, but she just kind of missed the place and turned around and just started looking back at Sodom, all right, and turned into a pillar of salt, okay? She lost her life, you know? Uh, so, uh, but anyway, they ended up in a cave, all right? Remember that? They got Lot drunk one night. I don't know what they drank, but... Uh, anyway, so, and then the girls uh, kind of had sex with their, with their own father, their dad. One of them had a, a son named Moab and another Ammoni, uh, the Ammonites. And, of course, they, they both had a group of offspring that, that grew and grew and grew, the Moabites and Ammonites, okay? But anyway, so that's where Ruth comes from. She, now, what's interesting is that the... It says in Deuteronomy, one of the illegitimate births shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of God. The Ammonite, Moabite, shall never not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to ten generations. Okay? Well, then how in the world did Ruth get into this thing? Okay? It's like, you know, you got some bad genes, you know. But God is so merciful. And, that, and, and so he, even though that's there, I'm telling you, I don't care what a sinner's background is. If we can have a heart of repentance and service, you know, go to God to try to find mercy and forgiveness, uh, he'll always get it, okay? I mean, there's, that's, what, that's God's heart, okay? So this is a lesson. It's a good lesson just for that, okay? If it says, that, uh, well, I already told you about Deuteronomy 28, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord God to observe his commandments, then all these curses are going to come on you and overtake you. And like I said, we are not exempt from that. It's still true uh, that we must, we must, and we can only do it by the power of God. The problem with under the first commandment, or I'll say the first uh, covenant, at Mount Sinai, Moses read the law, you know, said, hey, how's everybody, you know, you got to obey these commandments. And the people said, no problem, we'll obey them. But the problem was, they're, they're people born of Adam. They had the sin nature. And it's impossible to do other than temporarily do something good, something bad. But ultimately, you can't. Because if you break the smallest stroke of the law, you've broken the whole law. And then God says, you are a lawbreaker. Okay, does that make sense? No, there has to be a second command or a second covenant. Behold, the days are coming, like a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with them at Sinai, which they broke. Okay, Moses comes down, takes ten commandments and throws them on the ground. He said, I'll, I'll take away their heart of stone and I'll give them a new heart. I'll put my spirit in them, which will cause them to obey my commandments. Okay, so anyway, uh, those are... Just kind of a looking over the history of things. Uh, and um, so, anyway, but because of the famine, uh, Naomi and Elimelech and, uh, decided to take off and go to Moab, okay? But like I said, Moab isn't in covenant with God, okay? And, and there's consequences. Always, you know, it, it says bad things are going to happen if you disobey, you know? And sure enough, Elimelech, died. Uh, and the two sons of Naomi died, okay? Well, it, it, that's the consequences. And of course, they, these two sons married some Moabite women, okay? And, and so, uh-oh, now, so the sons died, uh, this, their father-in-law died, and, uh, and now they're in trouble. But they got a rumor, heard that there's uh, the food now in Bethlehem, okay? back in Judah. So uh, Naomi says, man, I'm heading back over there. And so he, she told the two Moabite women, you better go just go back to your parents' house and reconnect and uh, maybe you can get a husband and, you know, 
get, get, get your life back in your family. Now, what's interesting is Ruth decided not to do that, okay? And, and she made a statement, a commission that said, you know, it says, uh, she said, don't tell me, this is what she said to Naomi, do not push me and entreat me to, to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God shall be my God. Wherever you die, I'm going to die, and there I'll be buried. The Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death departs or separates you and I. Now, I'm just going to tell you something. We talked about commitment, you know, and commitment is something when you make that decision, like to commit our lives to Christ, you can't leave a back door on that, okay? It's like, like I said, jumping out a 30-story window. You know, once you jump out and you're flying down the road, or, you know, or down, down to hit the parking lot, you can't change your mind and, ooh, I think I'll just head back up there. No, it's over. You know, and we literally, that's, we have to do that. But that's what God honors. That's what God honors, okay? To, uh, and uh, you remember Paul one time said he, he was a uh, servant, you know, a, a, what, what kind of servant, what would you call it? Um, oh, shoot. All right, well, there's two kinds of servants, okay, or a, a set slaves, you might say, or whatever. Bond servant is what I'm trying to say. Paul said that he's a bond servant of Christ. Well, what happens is, according to the law in, in Israel, if you got into debt and you couldn't pay your bills, and let's just say you, you know, they were going to take your land from you or uh, force you into slavery so they can get, collect your money, something like that, um, you know, you could, somebody may step forward and, and say, okay, I'll pay your bills, but you've got to come and live at my ranch and do work and that kind of stuff because it's going to... Uh, you know, kind of pay for what I'm having to spend for you to get you out of debt, okay? Does that make sense? You know, but according to the law, they have what, what's called uh, a seven-year uh, event that happens, okay, uh, that all of a sudden, after seven years, the debt's forgiven completely, okay? So if a person, uh, let's just say, has some debt and can't get out of it, and uh, they're in big, big trouble, and somebody kind enough to, to come and start paying off their bills and uh, uh, so they can get out of debt, at the end of the seven years, boom, you know, they, they basically become free, okay? The debt's been paid, they're back to square one. Okay, does that make sense? You know, but, so what's a bond servant, okay? A bond servant never has an end, okay? The debt servant, seven years, then you're out the door. Okay, does that make sense? But what happens when the seven years is up and you're now free to go, all right, that's when you decide, well, you know what? This guy that paid my debt or this relationship is so great. It's so perfect. You know, uh, this life that this, ma this man or this individual is giving me, he's you know, I get everything here, protection, I get food, I get encouragement, I get growth, I get, you know, whatever. So I don't ever want to leave this guy, okay? So he makes this commitment that's a forever kind of thing, okay? That's, that's what Ruth was saying, okay? Don't have, I mean, it, you know, I'm going to die before I ever split up with you. It's never going to happen, okay? And that's what Paul did, okay? When we first come into relationship with Christ, guess what? we get the debt forgiveness, okay? But once we realize the many blessings of Christ in you, the hope of glory, you know, then you realize, man, I, I, I want to make this a permanent forever commitment and enjoy the benefits of that. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what Paul did. He, that's a bond servant. Now they actually had, if you go back to the Old Testament, they actually had a ceremony that you'd go through. You know, like you'd go into the front porch of this person that just provided anything and everything you needed uh, to become a bond servant, and you'd have to go up and stand by one of the pillars out there, and they'd pull out your ear and take an awl or something, boom, just kind of poke a hole in it, all right, and nail you to that, you know, 
piece of wood that's holding up the house, okay? And, and uh, they put a little ring in your ear or something like that, and somebody could just look at you and know that, uh-oh, see, he he's no longer him, owns himself. Somebody else owns him, all right? And that's, that's what we need to be, all right? We can't be divided up. Well, I'll run this show, you know. It's like that guy driving a car around that says, God is my co-pilot, all right? Wait a minute. Wait, I thought God was supposed to be your pilot. Well, here's the problem. You know, if God, God is my co-pilot means I'll run the show, but I got God in my back pocket here. You know, if I get into trouble, whatever, then I'll you know, yank out, you know, the credit card, <laughs> whatever, and ask God to help me. Well, that is a lousy place to be. You know, and, and that is lukewarm. And you know, what does Jesus think about people that are lukewarm? He's going to spit you out of his mouth. And in the end times, God is making every single person in the earth, there are going to be great trials and tribulations, you know, and it's, it's God's purpose. Everyone has to decide. Everyone. All right? The wicked have to make their decision, also a permanent decision, okay? And, the, you know, Christians, all of us, we say, well, I'm Christian, you know, or whatever. But it... it for the only way God can accept it is if I mean it with everything I've got, okay? And if I don't have enough, then he can change me and add the energy so that I can do a perfect commitment. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's see. Many are the called, but few are the chosen. Hmm, what in the world does that mean? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many, you know, shall say, Lord, Lord, did I not do this and that in your name? Okay. But Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. In other words, you didn't obey my commands. Do you know why? They hadn't fully committed their life to Christ. They, they were driving around with their bumper sticker, okay, I, you know, I, God's my co-pilot. Does that make sense? Okay. And most, I'm telling you, the majority of people in church think that it's just, you know, that thing going to church is just an insurance poly, policy when the end times come. That's all it is. No, man, you, you've got to give God, you've got to... Commit 1,000%. And then all of a sudden, you're going to find the joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit. A love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control, and the ability to say no to sin. And, and you'll find all of a sudden your prayers come to life. And the words that you speak happen, you know, because it's God within us. He lives in us. Okay, and Jesus said, the things that I do shall you do also. Even greater things than these you can do, because I go unto the Father, you know. And so what I'm saying is, we, we can't be in between, forget it, just forget it, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, one interesting thing about Ruth uh, is that, well, I'm going to say one thing about Naomi. Naomi Naomi, remember, her name meant pleasant, pretty, goodness, and all that kind of stuff. But when she came back, uh, you know, after the famine passed by, uh, she went into Bethlehem, and, and, and they said, Hey, Naomi. She said, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara or Mary. Now, let me ask you a question. There were three women at the crucifixion watching Jesus die. What were their names? Mary, Mary, Mary. Quite contrary. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Mari means bitterness. The first stop on the path through the wilderness was, was a pond of water. The, everybody wanted some water to drink, but they went up and drank it, and it was bitter. Just bitter. And so they ran to Moses and said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so Moses prays. You know, there are 40 different incidents throughout <laughs> the 
you know, through the wilderness or something like that, each one has a lesson, okay? So God told Moses, he said, just get yourself a tree, you know, a big branch of the tree and throw it in the water, you know, and that water will become sweet and clean, okay? Well, that's a type of the cross, okay? And that was these women who were at the cross watching Jesus die, all right, and Mary, 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 well, they sensed that bitterness, okay? It, it, it's just hard to deal with. And, and Naomi said, man, I've been through so many difficulties. My husband died, my sons died, and I've got this Moabite woman here, and boy, she's friendly and she's insistent to follow me and all that kind of stuff, but there's, a bit, there's lessons everywhere, okay? Now, it says when they got back there, it was the beginning of barley harvest, Okay. Now, this is so important. The seven harvests, or I'll just say the feasts of Leviticus chapter 23, those seven feasts are a picture of the entire world. Okay, what do you mean by that? Started with Passover, okay, and then starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's when you go in and you clean your house to get all the leaven out, leaven being a type of sin. And then partway through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all of a sudden there's this thing called the Feast of First Fruits. Okay, well... The way they decide whether you know, they're going to start this month, the, the name of the month here is called Abib, which means ripe, okay? Well, you don't start harvesting your grain unless it's ripe, okay? So the first thing they do before they declare the month uh, to say, okay, it's time, you know, is they go out and grab some barley, you know, and they bring it up to the feast, or I should say Jerusalem, to the high priest and up. Uh, you know, up there, and they look at it, and they decide, yeah, it's ripe. So, bang, they say, okay, then now it's a Abib 1, and let's start the harvest. Let's go. But remember, the harvest is all about the, the family of God being harvested from the earth. This, from dust you're made to dust you're going to go, okay? God took this pile of dirt, blew into him the breath of life, and he became a living soul. All right, but now in order to get the second born, unless a man is born again, he cannot see, enter the kingdom of God because the first man is bound by sin, okay? But there has to be this commitment, you know, to a new life before God can give it. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So, but anyway, um, the harvest, the, the, the barley is the first fruits harvest, okay? And it gets ripe faster than the wheat, which is later harvested. And, of course, Ruth was there. And what was she doing gleaning? See, there are harvesters. You know, the steps. Here, here's the steps to produce grain. Choose the soil, till the ground, sow the seeds, clear the weeds, nurture the soil, cut or harvest with a sickle, glean at the time of harvest, gathering, threshing, flailing, treading on a threshing floor, separate the grain from the shaft, you know, go to your <clears throat> whatever uh, platform and you winnow, have what's called a winnowing fork, toss the, you know, mixture of grain and chaff up in the air and the wind blows and, and uh, you know, finally you end up with some grain. Does that make sense? But every one of these steps has a spiritual meaning. And the type of the grain is spiritual, Okay. The, the people that <clears throat> mature faster in their walk with Christ represent the barley, okay? The vast majority, yeah, I, uh, I have a, a friend who had a vision about walking through a huge wheat field. Jesus said one time, you know, at the Jacob's well, which actually represents Jesus, <laughs> you know, he's the well of life, okay? But anyway, this Samaritan woman uh, was there. He says, she, he says, go get your husband. She said, well, my, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, no, the man you're with right now is not your husband. But you, you've had five men before him, you know. And she said, I, I kind of can tell you're a prophet, okay. And she, and she laughed, you know. But she ran up to Samaria to tell everybody, this guy, there's a man down here. He, he said he's the Messiah, and man, I, he could see right inside of me and tell me about me. He knew everything about me. And, and the scriptures say that there was, the disciples came back, wondered what Jesus is doing. 
And they, he, Jesus said, lift up your eyes. For the fields are ripe unto harvest. What's he looking at? Many, many, many Samarians coming over the hill with a Samaritan woman. They, they're coming. They want to find this guy. You see, this is the harvest. The harvest. And, and we're to be active in that. To sow the seed. The sower is the son of man. The seed is the word of God. And the soil of the hearts of men. All right, in these last days, just like we think, man, if I could just live during the book of Acts, you know, I would experience all this move of God. Well, I'll tell you what, the glory of the latter house is much greater than that of the first house. You know, but this, it's time. Read this word. Ask for the rain in the time of the latter rain. That's what it says in Zechariah, you know, but we have to read the word, find out what it says, and then present it to God. This word Will, will not fail if you just return it to me, okay? That's the way he, he throws down some word, you know, so the, the anointed word, and, and that's, you know, how do you know what to pray for? It's, it's always find out what the will of God is. And that's what our prayers must be, okay? But he's always going to answer that prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we ask of him. That's pretty straightforward. And yet so many people think, well, you know, I'm going to pray in maybe six months, a year, or whatever else like that. We go to Matthew chapter 23, okay? <clears throat> They'd gone and they found this uh, tree, okay? And, and this um, tree was, they went over to see if it had any fruit on it. And it didn't have any fruit on it, so Jesus curses this fig tree. Okay, remember that? And then they travel, come back, and that thing's dead and wilted and all that kind of stuff. Look, Lord, the tree that you cursed is dead, you know? <clears throat> then the phrase says, have faith in God. That's not what it says. If you notice, it's in italics. You know what that means? It means that's not what the Greek said. So if you look in the margin, it'll show what the Greek said. And it said, have the God kind of faith. So what's the God kind of faith? To talk to things. To speak. Whatever I, out of the abundance of my heart, if I say what God says, then guess what? God's going to watch over his word to perform it. Okay? He said, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he's going to have whatever he saith. Okay? Jesus warned he said, every idle word that thou shalt speak, thou shalt give account there of the day of judgment. For by thy words shalt thou be justified, and by thy words shalt thou be condemned. Because this is the way God, he gives us authority. We all, the authority only works through the words, okay? And if we say what the devil says, then that's what's going to happen. Or if we say what God says, then that's what's going to happen. Does that make sense? <clears throat> but the next verse says this, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them. And then you will have it. So in other, time, in other words, when we say a prayer that we've, God's word, okay, and <clears throat> we know that he's, he does, he watches over his word to perform it. But I had to believe that. Okay, so when I, I have to, when I say amen, as far as I'm concerned, it's over. I've got it. Doesn't mean, if I, I may not, I'm not going to see anything, feel anything, because, you know, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, boom. Now that's now. And you shall have it. That's future. Okay, because then immediately when I say amen, God starts doing things to bring it to pass. Does, that, does this make sense? Okay. Now, yet, I, there's a guy I know that lots of people would come to him all the time and say, hey, would you pray for me? Do the, you know, I got this problem, that problem, this problem. And, and of course, uh, he kind of points out, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, you shall ask, it should be done unto you by my Father who is in heaven. You know, so he'll... This person that's coming and wants some prayer, 
you know, he'll first say, okay, but <clears throat> what, do want, what do we want to pray for? You want me to agree with you? Well, I can't agree with you unless you tell me what's, you know, what are we going to do? What are we going to pray for? Okay. So uh, <clears throat> he's going to say, well, what, what are we praying for? And where is the scripture? Where is the promise of God that he'll do it? Okay. Maybe, maybe it's providing finances. Maybe it's, you know, healing, uh, whatever. Okay. Um, but so uh, he goes through. Then he's going to ask, is there anything in your life, unforgiveness, anger, are there somebody you, don't, you, you know, you're having a hard time getting along with, uh, some things that you know that the Holy Ghost is convicting you to, that you're a little off base, you know, because we can't get an answer unless first you get, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, okay? We first get a, get a clean record here before we can step forward. Does this make sense? Okay. And, and so once this particular pastor, you know, go through all that kind of stuff, then he'll say, okay, now we're going to pray. Okay, and we're going to agree. We're going to say the promise to God, all right? And, uh, and then when, when I say amen to that prayer... Will you have the answer? Now, if that person says, gosh, I hope so, then that, that pastor says, well, forget it. We're, there's no sense praying. Because faith is the substance, the now possession of things hoped for. Faith, that prayer, when you say amen, that means God is good on his word, man. I don't have to hope, 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 you know. Then what I, before I, that has, has, before I do that, then, and I will say this pastor, this particular pastor, <clears throat> he tells a story one time about how he had a child who had this big arterial venous malformation on her face. I don't know if you've ever seen those. It's just kind of a big tangle of blood vessels or something that they were born with and they even grow a little bit. But anyway, he, you know, begin up being seeing this for a long time, and he it just got in his heart. Let's get rid of this thing, okay? And so <clears throat> he just started studying, and you know, kind of just focusing on various kinds of promises of healing and things of this sort. He said, "I, it's." He said, "I could quote them all. You know, it's not like I didn't know them, but I, I just God had to just anoint them enough." that I get, a, you know, that I know and I know that I know that I know, <laughs> you know, that I have the faith. Because remember, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, that's not hearing with this ear. It's hearing with a spiritual ear. Okay, does that make sense? He said, and after I did that for a while, I, I knew. Okay, I got to the place where I knew I had it. Okay, so, and then I, you know, prayed with my daughter got her degree and all this kind of stuff. And I said, amen. And I just said, okay, thank you, Lord. What things, whatever you desire when you pray, believe it, you receive and you got them. You know, so just then for several mornings, you know, get back up again and there it is. You know, uh, didn't bother him a bit. You know, as far as he was concerned, it was settled. This was it, okay. Now you have to remember when Daniel prayed, and every moment, every moment that you set your heart aright, I was sent with the answer. That's what the angel Gabriel said. As soon as you prayed, the, the whole earth, I mean, the whole kingdom of God began, sent the angels, and there was a war between the bad angels and the good angels, and it wasn't until Michael the archangel came through, and finally, 21 days later, you know, boom, he shows up to Daniel. He said, the moment you set your heart aright, I was sent with the answer. But we had this, you know. So anyway, this particular pastor, whatever, if he did, wasn't seeing things, it didn't bother him a bit, you know. But then one morning, he got up, went to breakfast, and the daughter came in, Daddy, 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 you know. I woke up this morning, and this thing, it was laying on my pillow, you know. 
it, it fell off, okay? And so then we just thank God. Thank God for the surety of his promise. Now, is that, all this making sense? You know, but we have to come to this place where we have to trust and believe in God. There's no possible way, no possible way. You know, the devil's always going to come and try to bring up fear and doubt or whatever, somebody else's thoughts or something like that, or maybe unconfessed sin, you know, uh, that whatever things aren't happening, there's always a reason. There's always a reason, okay? So uh, anyway, I hope that makes sense. All right, now, um, boy, man, let's... All right, we finished chapter one. Uh, chapter two was, um, gets into this Elimelech. Remember, that was the former husband of Naomi. And Naomi, by this time, is an old, kind of an older lady. She's probably in her 50s or whatever. But she's not, obviously, Ruth, who was married to one of her sons. Uh, now, uh, they're there. And here's the problem. Now, the, the problem is, in all of Israel, remember when they uh, took the various tribes and moved into the promised land, they always split up the land and passed it out to all the different tribes so that every family, you know, would get something except the Levitical priests, the Levitical uh, tribe, Levi. Remember that? Okay. Because the Levitical people, the, their job was to operate in the ministry. Okay, so they ran the tabernacle and did all the teaching and, uh, you know, helped people understand how and what to do, uh, you know, sacrifices to receive forgiveness and restoration of relationship with God, on and on and on and on. But everybody else had some land and that, that was their, you know, basically way to make a living, grow some things and trade this for that or whatever. It, it make, that make sense? But, but if a person... Somebody died in the family, okay, especially a male, which had, um, you know, now all of a sudden uh, you can get into debt. You can't, a woman can't go out and plow the fields and do whatever, and they end up getting into debt and they'll lose it. Now, we already talked about how some people get rescued from that by somebody adopting the debt or whatever in, in, in exchange for some labor, okay. But... Uh, but anyway, now uh, Elimelech was dead. He died. The land that they had no longer had, uh, uh, you know, any recovery. Does this make sense? Now, <clears throat> they had this tradition. If you go to Deuteronomy 25, it says, If brothers dwell together and one dies without a son, the widow of the dead man shall be married to her husband's brother and perform the duty of a husband's brother to him. In other words, Let's say you got a family and there's two boys in the family. Both of them have wives and they got kids or whatever else like that. But uh, one of the husbands dies. You know. Now <clears throat> this is called the leverate rescue in a way. Okay. Uh, to the, you know the, the the brother that stayed alive. He's supposed to marry the widow uh, of the one that died. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, so he has more than one wife, but, I mean, the whole purpose of that is to maintain the family line, okay, because otherwise that family name is going to go away, okay? Uh, so, but it's a way of expressing some love uh, to these families to preserve their longevity. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, but anyway, that, that's, this is a, an important uh, connection, okay? Now, it, and if... For whatever reason, it says, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother, in other words, to marry the widow, to maintain the family line and ownership of the land. Okay, it says, The elders of this city shall call and speak to him. But if he still stands firm, saying, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of elders and remove 
the man's sandal from his foot, saying, So shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. His name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who would not remove his sandal. Okay, well, that's kind of weird, you know. Uh, something about this sandal has some effects, okay. But, you know, that if we start looking for all kinds of scriptures that have the word sandal, but let's just do a, couple, a few minutes of this. John the Baptist said, Indeed, I baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. His winnowing fan, remember we talked about harvest and all, how to do these things to the various uh, grains. His winnowing fan is in his hand, okay? And he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. You know, of course, taking a harvest requires cleaning it all up from the shaft, which still represents uh, some sin or corruption or something. The wind that blows away the shaft from the, from the grain represents the Holy Ghost, okay? Uh, the threshing floor. And, and what's interesting, Boaz was the guy who was throwing it up. And, but here now, first John the Baptist is saying, guess who handles the winnowing, you know, when you go get water baptized? Jesus. Because he wants everybody clean. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the shaft he'll burn with unquenchable fire. Well, one way or another, he's going to do that, okay? Now, <clears throat> here's interesting. So, why did John say the sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose? Because, see, physically, we're talking about people that get into debt, okay? And, but Jesus removes our debt, which what is what? Sin. Okay? And so he, he is our kinsman redeemer in a sense because he's one of our kinsmen. Being, you know, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And you say, well, you know, wait a minute. He, he's not a man. No, he is a man. Okay? Okay, does this make sense? So since he's our kinsman redeemer, you know, he... he not only gets us clean, all right, but John the Baptist said he's, you know, he's not qualified or able to pull off the sandal strap. Okay, now wait, what in the world? Because the sandal strap has to do with the kinsman redeemer. In other words, the kinsman redeemer is the one who agrees to buy, pay all of your debt, which is sin. Does this make sense? All right, now, okay, here's, now we go to the Passover meal. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come to God, or from God, and was going to, to God, he rose from supper, or laid aside our garments, or his garments, took a towel, girded himself, and he poured water into the basin, and he took off their sandals and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, that's a weird thing. John the Baptist said, well, I'm not qualified to pull off the sandals. But that, that's what he does at the Passover. He pulls those sandals off and he washes their feet. Now, we have to understand that spiritually, okay, this has to do with removal of sin, paying the price for sin. That qualifies him to be able to remove that sandal. Well, what's this sandal? The sandal is what separates you from the earth. All right. Now, he, here's... Uh, what, where is it at here? Joshua. The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, this is after he crossed the Jordan, you know, when he was ready to go to war, all right, and he ran into Jesus, the, 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 you know, the captain of the army. And here's what Jesus says to him. Take your sandal off your foot, for the place that you stand is holy. All right? If you don't take your sandal off, you can't stand on holy ground. You see this? Remember at the burning bush. All right, the word of God comes out. Moses, Moses, take your sandals off. This is holy ground. And what's the promised land? 
as a place of holiness where the sin has been washed away. But we cooperate that, you know, he, he takes the old shoes off in a sense by which we tread the earth, okay, and experience that life of sin and failure from the first Adam. Is this, this it's kind of weird stuff, isn't it? But that's one of these little things that are just kind of hidden, hidden sometimes in the scriptures, okay? Um, anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting. The other thing that uh, we'll probably have to kind of get in next week, but uh, we talked about the wings. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. And uh, now what's in it? These wings, what in the world is that? Okay, this a woman read a book, in, uh, read, read the scripture of Malachi. And she said, when the son of righteousness, S-U-N, son of righteousness comes, he will come with healing in his wings. So she said to herself, if I go but touch the hem of his garment, talking about Jesus, I know I'll be healed. All right. So even she had this hemorrhage for 12 years, you know, she was considered unclean, okay? And she wasn't supposed to be around anybody, all right? But she pushed away. She, she just pushed away into the crowd. Jesus surrounded by a crowd of people, all right? And Jesus um, had this thing called a talit on, okay? Now, what, what is this? Okay, well, this is the prayer shawl. This is where if you get underneath it, you're, you're in the secret place of the Most High, okay? Under the shadow of the Almighty, all right? And the wings are those things that kind of hang over your shoulder. They have what is called the tzitzit, the talit. And, and these, it turns out that the numerical value of this is 613, which corresponds to the laws that are in the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible. But every time a man puts on this, he always is supposed to gather together the seat seat, you know, that's hanging down and look at them and realize that these represent God's commandments. And at that moment, you're coming into the presence of the Father, Christ, okay? And, and this is the secret place of the Most High, okay? under the shadow of the Almighty, okay? And, and the whole thing, God runs everything is with the commandments, okay? And, and there you, what he commands is you're to take these little seat seat, there's four of them, and they have a royal blue color, I'll talk about that in a second, called the teklet, okay? But you're to take these seat seat and wrap them around your fingers and vow, promise, commit, Never to forget the commandments of God. Now you've heard of something about if you tie a string around your finger to forget, you know, you do that so you don't forget something, right? Well, guess where that comes from? It, this has been around for thousands of years. This comes from God's command in Deuteronomy. Wrap the string of the seat seat around your finger and swear. Promise never to forget God's commands, okay? Now, when a man wants to marry a woman, guess what he does? He takes these wings and puts them on the woman. Well, you know, when Ruth went at night, you know, to the threshing floor, Boaz is sleeping. Now, remember I said, who does the winnowing of the wheat and the chaff or <coughs> barley and chaff? It, it, it was Boaz, but John says it's Jesus, okay? Does that make sense? Boaz is a type of Christ, okay? All right, and so uh, Naomi understood that if he's the kinsman redeemer, that's also Christ, okay, who washed the feet of the disciples, make sense? All right, but she says, go lay down, uncover his feet. Well, that, she did that, and then, you know, Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and, and looks down there, and there's Ruth. Who are you? What, what's going on? Well, I'm Ruth. Okay, Naomi's, you know, uh, 
da yeah, daughter-in-law, okay. And, and uh, she says, cover me with your wings. In other words, remember what I said, if a man does that, what is it? It's to offer a covenant of marriage. She was saying, will you marry me and be my kinsman redeemer? Okay, to revalue or to restore the, what was lost when Elimelech died, okay? And all this property and value and all these kind of things, okay? And, and Moab was like, wow, okay? And she was a young, beautiful woman, you know? And he said, I, I'm impressed. Everybody knows that you are a righteous woman and that you always accurately follow. You, all you think about is what's right, okay? And you know how that happened? Because she made a commitment. And, and when we make that commitment, God, I'm telling you, God will boom, 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 you know, put the power, the necessary, the commitment, the, you know, bring it to life, you know, uh, because we get born again, then the power is in us, okay? Remember, there's a First John scripture that says, no one who's born of God does any sin. No one, no one, if you're born of God, you do not sin, nor can you sin, because God's seed indwells you. Now, wait a second, you know. But then these other verses say, I write these things unto you, my children, so you do not sin. But if you do, you know, we have an advocate before the Father, and you can pray, and, uh, you know, God will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So what, what's the conflict here between these two verses? And, well... The one who's born of God cannot sin because God's seed indwells him. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about Jesus. And if you're born again, he's in you. He's down in your holy of holies. He's sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. There's two set places to on that Ark. Okay? And the Bible, the Father says... It's my, it's like a footstool to me that he's on the ark and on his right side is Christ. <laughs> he, he lives in us, okay? He's the one that does not sin. He cannot sin. He is the seed of God, okay? And, and if I'm born again, that, you know, it is God that works within you, both to will and to do of his good purpose, Okay? And, and so he's the ability, you know, for me to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to give me the power, okay, the hope, the confidence, the glory, on and on and on and on, okay? And, and like I said, you know, the Greek word for this is the sperma. Of, that's the sperma of the Father. That's the way Father has spiritual kids, through the anointed Word of God, okay? And... Just like Mary, Mary said, may it be unto me according to thy word. The rhema, the sperm. You know, I've not known a man, so how am I going to have this little baby? You know, well, you know, this is a child of God. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Okay. But um, anyway, it, it is amazing um, how many kind of hidden things there are in this book of Ruth, you know. Uh, if somebody jumps in the middle of the video, they're wondering why I'm wearing this thing. Uh, but, Luke, come and take this, would you please? Yeah. But, okay. Meditate, you know, on these things. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. There's something that happens when we meditate on the word that the Spirit of God uh, anoints it and brings it more and more and more to life. David said, I have hidden thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And he said something interesting. He said, I, I uh, uh, stir my heart with a noble theme as I confess the word to my king. And my tongue in that process becomes the pen of a ready writer. God writes his word in my heart as I meditate on it, confess it, believe it. It just comes to life. 
and then it's hidden down there. When you know something by heart, do you have to go look it up? It just pops up. It, it, it's part of you. And that's what we want. Does that make sense? Uh, so, Ruth is a short book, only four chapters, but uh, it's got a lot to say, a lot of things to learn. Uh, it is. So, I'm going to say close with a prayer. All right, Father God, I just thank you for your word, that your word is, is alive. It's alive, Father, and it's the means by which that you impart life, wisdom, understanding, power, and everything in your children, Lord. The whole purpose of all of this is that God wants a family. And the creation is temporary. The things that are seen are temporary and are going to pass away. But during this time, everyone has to make a choice who we're going to serve. We have to make a firm and dedicated, unbreakable choice to God to receive the fullness of what he offers or just... Bring that reality to our perception and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.